And Lord, we do. Before we do anything else, we want to come and just submit and commit the year ahead into your hands, Lord. Knowing that we can trust you. You've shown your faithfulness in so many ways over this past year. And we, we can come into this year knowing that we, you are faithful. In every detail and in every way, you're faithful. And we can trust you to take care of everything. So we want to spend this time this morning just really committing the year ahead into your loving hands. And knowing that whatever happens, you love us. You have our very best at heart. And you will bring us through. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
treasure that I see, you are my original. Seeking you as a precious jewel, want to give up, I'd be a fool, you are my
Amen. Let's just commit this time to the Lord. And Lord, we do pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit and the quickening of your Holy Spirit upon your word, that it may change us, it may speak to us, it may really minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Just four separate verses. Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then Genesis 6, 13. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Then Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Then Judges 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And Judges 21, 25 repeats exactly the same thing again. So these are just four little verses that speak of very specific times of chaos. Now I think if we look back over the past three years, we would all agree that for many of us it has been a time of chaos. As we welcomed in 2020, three years ago, we didn't have a clue of what was lurking just two months down the road. Came the first lockdown that was promised to just be a couple of weeks while they sorted everything out, and then that dragged on for months and months and months. Horrible time where just about every business was closed. You weren't even allowed to go and visit your friends. You weren't even allowed to go out of your gate and take a walk on the road. We, we so quickly forget just what it was like. The masks, the hand sanitizer, the pressure and the manipulation to get vaccinated, the daily update it, on News 24 of how many people got the virus yesterday, how many died, how many... Whoa. And not one of the so-called prophets of God, that certainly that I saw, prophesied that it was coming, saw it coming. In fact, one guy even said that COVID was never going to come to Florida, where he happens to live in, in America. He said COVID is not going to come to Florida, but it did. And then... In this country, just a year later, we had a terrifying week of absolute chaos. Murder, destruction, uh, devastation to the, to the tune of billions and billions and billions of rands. And then, yeah, in case it then came floods. We just thought we'd got over the floods in Durban, and then we had more floods. And then all the time there was Eskom had the worst year of load shedding ever. And the conservative estimates, I, I've looked at various things, but the conservative estimates are that load shedding is costing this country over a billion rands a day. Every single day. One billion, over a billion rands. We don't even begin to understand what a billion rands looks like. And it has now turned into a national tragedy because 60 KFCs have had to shut down temporarily. That's a, that's a tragedy. 60 KFCs have shut down temporarily just because of load shedding and they don't have generators and they can't fry the chicken. And we could just go on and on and on about the chaos that's all around us. Not just in this country. And, and we're not unique in the chaos. If you look at other parts of the world, there is, in some respects, even worse chaos. And then, for many people, there's just the personal chaos of terrible, crippling illness, financial pressure, unhappy, miserable relationships, deep, deep hurts that just never seem to get healed. 
And, and the truth is that we are living in a time of chaos. But I think the most troubling chaos of all is the spiritual chaos that we find ourselves in. We really are in a time of spiritual chaos. Uh, it seems to me that every year I encounter fewer and fewer people who really are willing to take God seriously and who are willing to truly make Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. I see people on Facebook posting strong Christian messages one day, tomorrow they're posting messages from some spiritualist, and the day after they're telling you what rock or crystal will be the best one to sort out your problems for you. Uh, and just so you, you, you think that I'm not exaggerating, here's a quote from a Facebook page of the wife of an acquaintance of mine, and it's a woman who claims to be a Christian. This is what was, she posted a little thing on her Facebook page. Join us for a free online event with expert healer and Prisma founder, Greg Whiting, to experience his powerful holistic healing approach and receive a Prisma energy medicine healing to regulate your nervous system, calm your cardiovascular system, and boost your immune system. Prisma combines neuroscience and energy med medicine with somatic and mindfulness-based practices to help you transform your symptoms, big or small, into aliveness, empowerment, truth, and freedom. And it says there, Greg's approach to healing combines ancient teachings and practices, yoga, Ayurveda, Advaita Vedanta spiritual philosophies in one comprehensive system to make healing practical, accessible, effective, and even fun. You can even have fun while you're getting healed by this man. <laughs> but as I say, the spiritual chaos of, of it all is, here is a Christian woman claiming to be a Christian, putting that junk on her Facebook page and encouraging people to, to listen to this idiot. Spiritual chaos. Absolute chaos. And as I said, all four of these passages all deal with chaos. First, natural chaos in Genesis 1-2. The earth was waste and void and darkness was on the face of the waters. It was natural chaos. Secondly, man-made chaos in Genesis 6. Um, and, and the New American Standard probably makes it a bit clearer. It says, Then God said to Noah, The end of humanity has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of people, it says. The earth is filled with violence because of people. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. In those days it was fallen man in the time of Noah who caused the chaos very much as we see today. And then thirdly, there was divinely created chaos. The thing uh, that rocked Egypt to its foundations when God came and acted in judgment. Exodus 12, 12. I will go through the land of Egypt. I'll smite all the firstborn. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And then spiritual chaos in Judges. Everyone just doing Pretty much like today, what was right in his own eyes, just through what he thought, like that guy, just let's make up some stuff and believe it. And, and probably as we go into a new year, I, I don't think we're going to see a, a lessening or an easing of the chaos. And as we head in with that possibility that it probably is not going to get a lot better, but may even get a whole lot worse. The very searching question that we've got to face, uh, more than anything else, is what is my attitude at a time like this? How am I heading at a time like this? Is this chaos that's all around me driving me towards God or away from God? What is the chaos doing to me and my walk with the Lord? Closer to God or further from him. You see, so many Christians just opt out in situations of chaos. They just roll over, look for other sources of comfort and strength, 
they just kind of abdicate to the devil. Uh, how many people do you know who over the past three years found it just so much easier to sit at home in their pajamas, watch a bit of church as and when they happen to feel like it? And the truth of the matter is that very soon they find themselves feeling like it less and less and less because a little coal all on its own will very quickly go out. But the hugely important truth that we find with all four of, other, of those scriptures, in all those varieties of chaos, what we must never lose sight of is that God was present in all of them. God was at work in the midst of all those situations of chaos. And, and in the midst of it, it's never easy to know that God is there. In that week, uh, in July, year before last, when there was that absolute devastation, it's not easy to, to not have your eyes on the situation and to bring yourself back to that place where you know that God is in control. You may have to face a, a grim personal tragedy, which it seems impossible, where, 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 you, where you, you just really, where is God? Where is God in the midst of all of this? And, and don't let people say, well, it, you must just die. It is hard. It's not always easy to discern God and to hear Him and to know Him in the midst of that chaos. And for many, so for many, it's just a whole lot easier to just more and more leave God out of it and just start thinking and getting into that mindset that the devil is just having his own way, running riot, and he's running the show. But if we look beyond the chaos to God's word, we find reassurance that despite all of the perplexing events, we do well to know that God is there, he's moving, and he's doing, and he's working in his own way, even if we don't understand fully right now what God is doing. This is the right attitude, to have absolute faith in what God has said in his word, to absolutely trust that what God has said in his word is absolutely so. So much better than dwelling just in speculation where you've got to rely and look to human understanding, your own understanding or other people's understanding. So much better to leave all of that behind and just get back to the security of God's Word. And as I said, God was there in all four of those situations of great chaos. Natural chaos, man-made chaos, divinely initiated chaos, spiritual chaos. God is there. He moved, it says, on the face of the waters. He grieved over the inevitability of the flood. God wasn't happy to flood the earth. He grieved over it. He made it clear that it was he who was visiting Egypt in judgment. He raised up from time to time through the book of Judges in the midst of that spiritual chaos. He raised up judges to keep calling Israel back. And ultimately, right through it all, in the midst of that chaos, he was working and heading towards Samuel and then ultimately King David and the glory of the temple. He was never absent, never distant, right there on the spot in the midst of it all. And also, we also need to see that in, in each of these chaotic situations, there was a creative aspect. God was busy doing a creative thing. In the midst of that darkness and chaos, chaos of, of, of the creation came God's creative word. Let there be light. And there was light. Genesis 6.13, God said in the midst of the chaos, build an ark. Build an ark. Don't look. No, don't look at the situation and get caught up at what this one's saying and doing. Just build an ark. Exodus 12 verse 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month, the month of the Passover, 
shall be unto you the beginning of months. Just, just coming out of all of that chaos and judgment and everything of the Passover, this month will actually be the beginning of months. And 1 Samuel 16 verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day onwards. We need to remember this as you just look upon the world and you just see the absolute ever-growing chaos. God is busy creating and doing and working. And, and maybe we have to face squarely the prospect of even more chaos. And if it does get worse, will we abdicate? Saying that the power of evil is just so great and so overwhelming that we've got to start trying to take matters into our own hands. We've got to try and protect ourselves and sort it out. Or in the spirit of escapism, will we then just, as many do, just focus all of our spiritual attention on the rapture and just say, well, it's getting bad, it's getting worse, but praise God, he's going to take me out of here before it gets really bad. <laughs> I'm just going to escape. People often ask me, do you believe in a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-tribulation rapture? The answer is simply this. The pattern of Scripture strongly points towards a pre-tribulation rapture. Even in two of the passages that we've read this morning, God's pattern was to take His people out before the judgment, to, to, to get His people away. He, he snatched Noah and his family out before the judgment fully came, took Israel out before the full wrath of that judgment hit them. But you know, it really doesn't matter. It's actually irrelevant. I'm not going to fight you over whether you say pre, post, mid, all three, all together. It really doesn't matter. Because our hearts should always just be simply, Lord, I want to live my life in such a way that if I have to have three and a half years of terrible tribulation and judgment, or if I have to make it through seven years of deep tribulation and judgment, then it's going to change absolutely nothing about my faith in you and my walk with you. That's the way I want to be. That God even doesn't matter. My opinion about the, the rapture is irrelevant. But God, I want to walk in such a way that I keep walking no matter what, Keep believing no matter how. That's the crucial issue. So are we going to live just clinging in there by our fingernails in the hope of a pre-trib rapture and, and that I'm just going to somehow last until Jesus comes and snatches me away? Or are we just going to sort of muddle along, sort of summer going with the flow and perhaps maybe watching a bit of church at home in your pajamas once in a while? kind of just to keep, maybe hope that I can keep touch with God in my pajamas somehow? Or, or will we be those who hear God's creative word? It was God's word that brought order out of that creation chaos. Nothing else. God's word brought the order. Noah, who found grace with God, he did God's word to him. Obediently building the ark and Hebrews 11.7 condemned the world and, and in the midst of that became an heir of righteousness which is according to faith. Israel's only protection, the only protection that they had was in heeding God's word and just doing the very simple what seemed may, maybe even to some just this foolish act of just putting blood on the doorposts and the lintels. God's word promised a prophet and later a king who would lay the foundation for Israel's finest hour. It was God's word that did it. Noah and the children of Israel and Samuel ignored the chaos and instead became part of God's new creative thing that he was doing in the midst of them. And we need to start listening to God's word. Become part of what God is doing. Instead of 
And it is so easy in these days to just get caught up in what's all around you. God's word. And, and, and out of the midst of that, no chaos at the beginning would have been no creation. No flood, no rainbow. No Passover judgment, no liberation for the people of God, and no entering in, finally, into the promised land. No chaos of everyone doing what's right in his own eyes. No Samuel, no King David, no ultimately the great temple. And, and, and it's the basis and the foundation of all of our faith that the greatest chaos of all history the cross of Jesus Christ, the greatest chaos of history, natural, physical, spiritual, everything all put together, the cross of Jesus Christ was the greatest chaos in history. But that chaos brought God's supreme creative act of order and redemption and salvation and eternal life. Out of that chaos came God's greatest work. The disciples were ready to run away because all their hopes seemed to have just crashed into ruins. But they found in that resurrection from the grave that God had actually, after all, been working in the midst of that chaos. And the more you look at the internet and the TV, the more you'll be depressed at the inevitable chaos of man's world that you see rising up all around you. The more attention you pay to the media, the more you'll be preoccupied with the, just the succession of trouble and disaster, all of which just seem to cry out, there is no hope, there is no future, we're going nowhere. And you'll end up listening to a silly little Swedish girl saying nonsense like, I don't want your hope, I want you to panic, and Bad enough that she says it, but double shame that people actually listen to her. And what the Swedish girl and Mr. Attenborough and the hordes like them don't ever realize is that this world does, in fact, lie under a curse. This whole world lies under a curse. No man or girl is ever going to save it. Just look at two scriptures that confirm that. Genesis 3 18 and 19. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. And then Romans 8, 23 to 22. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The creation right now is in the bondage of corruption. Into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. It's only believers in Jesus Christ who can ever and will ever be delivered out from under that horrible, horrible curse. According to 2 Peter 3, this earth is going to be destroyed and purged by fire. 2 Peter 3 verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then chapter, uh, verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's a little bit of global warming for you. Just a little touch of global warming. The elements will melt with, with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's global warming. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be 
in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness, no chaos, in which righteousness dwells. And those words that Peter wrote a couple of centuries ago are so much more easily understood now than they were when they were written. So much more true and so much closer to being fulfilled. And the speed at which things are heading towards what Peter wrote about all those years ago are just over and over and over and over again shouting out the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. The curse is present. It's very rapidly gaining momentum and very few, if any, parts of the earth are escaping from its closing in for the final phase and final climax of that curse. People are trying every type of desperate thing to escape the chaos. Let's stop buying plastic bags. Let's get an electric car. Let's move to this place or to that country. It's just so much more peaceful in New Zealand. Yeah, and you get the worst, most demonic prime minister in the whole world if you want to go and live in New Zealand, just saying. But, but the truth is that there is no escaping the chaos outside of Jesus Christ. There is no escape. There's the true story of an English family in the early 1980s. They were very worried about the whole thing of nuclear war and all sorts of things. So they set about, and they did a whole lot of research, they set about choosing the most isolated place they could find to go and live and just mind their own business and live in peace and quiet. So they ultimately settled on the Falkland Islands. Less than a year after they moved and uprooted and settled in the Falklands, the Falklands War broke out. Most, one of the most isolated places in the whole world. We'll just mind our own business. I think it was six months later the war broke out. There. It's all under curse. And the nature and the features of the curse, as the Bible every way reveals, the, 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 the product of that curse is hatred, evil, frustration, discontent, abortion, confusion, travail, breakdown, every and ever defeated struggle just against despair and despondency and death. And, and God help us to keep ourselves disentangled from the realm of the things of death and chaos. God help us in these days to live disentangled from the chaos. And oh, how we need to simply dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Abide under the shadow of His wings. Jesus urged us, and now more than ever, it's our greatest and most desperate need. Jesus urged us, abide in me. And so help us, O oh Lord, so help us to do that. So why not pay a whole lot more attention to God's word in Christ? Why not come fully into agreement with what God says? Agree with him in the, in the redemptive work that he's doing in right now, even in the midst of chaos. God is doing a work. God is doing something. In Matthew 6, 25 to 34, we can do no better this morning than just end on the words of Jesus. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. Is not, sorry, is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
are you not much more important than they are? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to his lifespan? Why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what are we to eat? Or what are we to drink? Or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. In verse 33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and as you do that, all these things will be provided, added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Then finally, finally, Luke 21, 25 through to 28. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars. And on the earth, there will be distress among nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting from fear and the expectation of the things that are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And then 34 to 36 of Luke 21. But be on your guard, so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. And we think, well, we kind of get away with that. We're not into the drunkenness thing. But it also says, weighed down with the worries of life. And that this day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. This earth that is under judgment and great chaos. But stay alert at all times, praying that you will have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. There is your responsibility in the midst of chaos. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, know that your redemption draws near. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. God, we, we repent of just so often having our eyes on the chaos around us. Even the little chaos of Eskim, we talk about it so much, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us, O oh God, where we just keep and spend and do so much of looking at, talking about, thinking about the chaos around us. And yet, Lord, even as we see in your word, in the midst of those four situations of great chaos, you were there, you were working, you were fully in control. And so in the midst of our time, and our time probably of increasing chaos, let us come back to that place this morning where we know that you are working You've not lost control for a single portion of even the one second. You are fully in control. Help us, O oh God, to straighten up, look up, and know as we see these things breaking out among us and around us, to know that our redemption is drawing very, very nigh, very, very close in Jesus' name. Encourage, strengthen, 
just establish us all again this morning in the truth of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.